which ones. And uh, <clears throat> I got a, Steve's got a video of that if you haven't seen it. She, <laughs> she put her cell phone inside of a bowl and then built a salad on top of it. <laughs> and it started vibrating. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> That was a great video. Uh, John chapter number three. We're studying uh, today as we come to this section of Jesus' life. And I'm, you know, you know, I'm trying to be teachy uh, and less preachy, and uh, just just to challenge myself and a few things. And, um, I always used to be teachy and not preachy. Then I got to preaching. And, but as we study topics in our Bible, uh, I'm trying today to to to. I'm trying to. I focused in this morning and just. You know, jot things down, milk and not meat, milk and not meat, milk and not meat. I try to do that and uh, uh, stay with it, make it a little milky today, you know, for because for, for, I, I enjoy the milk of God's word too, um, and, and the basics of the truth. But I tell you, when you're studying, I, I, I misnamed the sermon, the, the, the significance of the baptism of Jesus Christ. And, whew, whew. <laughs> could we journey the Old Testament, could we journey the significance of the baptism of Jesus Christ. What an understatement. Somebody who listen to the sermon would be very, very let down. Um, uh, we're just going to look at, we're looking at the two verses in Luke is what we're looking at, where Jesus Christ was baptized. The significance of this. It's the inauguration of his ministry. It's the beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ. It's the beginning of the requirement to be an apostle. You must have been there from the day of his baptism. It's the number one thing, uh, to, to be one of the 12 apostles. Um, but we're going to see just a few things. We're going to go through his baptism. Probably won't have time to, to really jump into the significance of it. But uh, let me just say for those of you who, who know your Bible well, you want to start, you want to begin by a journey backwards through your Bible in a study of the word anointing. And as you study the word anointing throughout your whole Bible, there's three that were anointed, the prophet, priest, and king. And you want to go and study each time a prophet and a priest or a king is anointed, especially the anointing of Aaron as, as a oil ran down his beard. You want to get the significance of oil, then you got to search oil in the Bible, search where it talks about the oil and gladness, and just, just and then understand Hebrews. Oh, I tell you, as you as you journey through that journey, uh, the significance of what takes place right here at Jesus' baptism will really begin to weigh on you. This is a huge moment in literally the time frame of Earth. This thing God calls from everlasting to everlasting, from, from those two time spaces, from creation of all things to the consummation of all things. If you could put significant events and make them in capital letters throughout, obviously the cross is there. The incarnation uh, when he was born was there, which Luke covered in the beginning. But this moment of Jesus' baptism would stick out in large letters, a significant moment in the history of mankind. And uh, why? Because, boy, God's doing something. And uh, so you want to study it. It's deeper than what we're touching today. That's what I guess I'm getting across. The significance of the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you say, why are you chuckling? Because I, uh, I just know. Um, <laughs> I'll not touch on that. Uh, John chapter 3, verse number 26. John chapter 3 and verse number 26. And uh, I, just, I want to just wet your whistle for a personal Bible study. If I use the use, is that a word? Down south it is. For yous that like to go a little deeper. John chapter 3, verse number 26. Um, can we read 10 verses? Would you mind standing for 10 verses? If, if you don't mind standing, I'd invite you to stand with me. Um, the Lord is in the presence of the church, and, and just an honor to God's word. Uh, we stand and say, Lord, we recognize this is your book. Um, we'll stand for the reading of it. They did that in the Old Testament, and uh, we'll do that here. Father, bless the reading of thy word. Go beyond the preacher. As I know you can. I know you will. In Jesus' name. And they came to John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond the Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. What's happening here is, is, is some disciples have come to John. They're talking about, John, you bore witness of this man named Jesus. You said he was he was greater than you. You're not worthy to, to loosen up his shoes. Uh, John, he's over there baptizing more than we are, or more than you are. What do you say about this? And uh, so this is what's happening. This is the context uh, of how, how it's going. So in verse number 27, we'll pick it up again. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, 
rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of earth is earthly. And it's just, just a note, if you like to note your Bible, John is referring to himself here. And, speak, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. Phew. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testified. And no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth him not the spirit by measure. God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not on the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. Lord, thank you for this truth. Oh, open up my mind to the Scriptures. Jesus, amen. You may be seated. It's hard for me to read that without my heart starts to move and it comes out of my voice and uh, gets a little shaky. It's just an awe-inspiring. There's so much said there. And you might want to get some references there, some Deuteronomy verses there. Deuteronomy 18, 19 should be cross-referenced there. But the verse I'm pointing at, the key verse, is that for this today is verse number 34. Not the key verse of the past, but the key verse for today is verse number 34. For, whom, uh, for he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. Now that's direct reference to Deuteronomy 18, 18, 18, 19. And you want to cross-reference that. You want to look that up. And please use that as a Muslim. <laughs> Let the Muslims know. <laughs> the Deuteronomy, because they accept the book of Deuteronomy. And help them understand who Jesus Christ is. But the second half of verse number 34 says, For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. And here we have this God giving to Christ uh, the full spirit, measureless spirit. The, the inference is there is God has given his spirit to prophets in the past. And even John the Baptist has received uh, the spirit of God. We know he said he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, wouldn't you like to be filled with the Holy Ghost right now? Right? I would say, yes, I'd like to be filled. Well, well if you're not, you're in sin. It's commanded. Be filled with, be, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you're supposed to be filled. What's the word filled means? It means yielded to the Holy Ghost. Now, you're in church today, and you came, and you're opening up, and you're listening to the preaching of God's Word. Well, must be you're listening to the Holy Ghost today, right? Because He leads people to church. So, uh, um, to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be yielded to the Holy Ghost. But it's also a receiving of power, and ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. The power of the Holy Ghost. And power and Holy Ghost are put together. In fact, uh, we'll see later where God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. Now, you can take that to the Jehovah Witnesses, friends. Uh, if you ever have any Jehovah Witnesses that, that you get to talk to about the Lord, many of them like to talk about the things of God, show them that the Holy Spirit is not power. The Bible always separates the two. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost. They're not the same thing. He anointed him with the Holy Ghost and with power. They're separated. The Holy Ghost brings power, but the Holy Ghost is not power. He's a person. And uh, you can prove that evidently. Remember, with the Jehovah Witnesses, to love them and care for them is always to take them to the deity of the Holy Spirit. They're prepared and preached on all the time about the deity of Christ, and they'll defend every Bible verse. But you take them to the deity of the Holy Spirit, especially in John chapter 16, and uh, you'll be able to help them and see that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, and our God is the Trinity. And you can really help somebody, maybe lead one of them to Christ. And uh, that would be wonderful. He gives to God, Jesus Christ receives from God the Holy Spirit without measure. Let's go over to our passage in Luke. We're studying through the Gospel of Luke. I just wanted to uh, give that to you right there. Why? Because you want to try to grasp what that means. Unlimited Holy Spirit. That's what he means by he gives it to him without measure. It tells us something about the difference between all others and all the other prophets that ever came and this prophet. We ought to get that idea because he just said, He that cometh speaketh the words of God. Now that's Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, which Moses says, God will raise up a prophet likened unto me. Uh, God uh, says, The Lord will put his words in his mouth, and whosoever shall not hearken unto him, it shall be required of him. Um, 
so this prophet is coming who will have the very words of God in his mouth. Moses said, he's going to be just like me. And boy, if you want to study that, find Moses' life, chronological order, and put it all down there, then compare it to the Jesus Christ. Whoa, my, oh my. When God says like me, he means like me. And that's a wonderful Bible study for anybody who wants to dig a little deeper into your scriptures and just prove to yourself this book can't be written by a man. It's just not possible. It's not possible for the human mind to conceive such a thing. It's more complicated than the human body. And how close are we to getting that down? <laughs> right. Some people go, oh, yeah, the virus kind of proves a few things. Right? Um, so here um, in Luke chapter number 3, we're looking at verses 21 and 22. So what I'm just saying is dig a little deeper into that passage there in John. What's it mean, the Holy Spirit, without measure? And why is Jesus, the Son of God, so unique in history? He is not like you and me. Don't don't even think. How many think Jesus is like you? <laughs> right? No, no, no. no. Perfect deity, which, which this is a, what's that called again? You say the same thing twice? It's a, uh, what was that? It's a, uh, oh, come on, the word left me. I've been having trouble with words this week. Um, uh, when you say the same thing twice, it's a, uh, it's repetitive, right? It's, Redundant. Thank you, Chuck. Yes, that's, re that's a redundancy. Perfect deity. God is perfect. So to say deity, deity has to be perfect. And so God took on perfect humanity. He didn't stop being God. He just took on perfect humanity. And I know that's close to some of you, especially my wife, but perfect humanity, we've never seen it. We don't know what it is. He's not like me and you, right? And God anointed him now with the Fullness of the Spirit. I mean, fullness of the, the, the Holy Spirit without measure. Access to the seven, I don't have that many fingers, to the seven spirits of God. Right? And you know what I'm talking about, right? Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. The seven spirits of God. Isaiah, uh, Roman, uh, Revelation chapter uh, 5, 4. Revelation chapter 4, the throne of God, the seven spirits before, the uh, seven eyes that are in Christ, which are the seven spirits of God, which roam through the whole earth. The seven, the perfect, the perfect number of God, the complete completion, the completion of the Holy Spirit, all belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And now God gives him the Holy Spirit without measure. You put all that together, do you, uh, okay, that's John chapter 3. Dig. Oh, our word. Okay, milk. <laughs> it's so hard. Look at Luke chapter 3, verse number 22. This is, our Bible is amazing, uh, amazing to know this book. Oh, to know this book. I can't wait to get to know this book. Verse number 21, it says, And now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, Thou art my Beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. What a statement. Wow. What's happening here? What what can we see? Um, is happening. Um, it came to me. I wrote this little we have a conflict. Okay, here. Let's 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 compare a couple scriptures. Go to Matthew, keep your spot here, and, and get about eleven fingers, borrow somebody from your neighbor, and take a look at Matthew. And uh, uh let's take a look at Matthew chapter three. There's a conflict that takes place at the baptism. The con conflict is between two godly men. It can happen. And this conflict comes between the Lord Jesus Christ and John the Baptist. And they come in, and there's a con conflict that takes place. John, or Matthew chapter number 3. I'll try to say it right for the sake of poor Chuck back there trying to flip around verses on this computer screen. Matthew chapter number 3 and verse number 13 and 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Or 17. There's no 18. <laughs> Verse number 13 says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan, unto John, to be baptized of him. So all, we read over there, it says all the people in Luke were coming to get baptized of John, and then comes Jesus. So this is the same time moment that happens. Jesus comes from Galilee, he comes up from Nazareth, and he comes to get baptized by John along with all the other people. He comes to get baptized along with all the other people. He comes to get baptized along with all the other people. You want to get that down. There's an important phrase there, putting those two together. Anyway, 
He comes to get baptized. And what happens? There's all of a sudden a conflict. John the Baptist is preaching at the end of his sermon. And John says, now those of you that would like to be baptized for the repentance of sins, showing that you have put your faith that God will forgive your sins without the tabernacle, without the priesthood, without the sacrifices, God will forgive you and show you mercy. And you need to get ready. You need to get your deeds changed. But before you get baptized, come back in a week or two and show me that you proved that you've repented from your sin. Bring forth fruits of repentance before you get baptized. Prove it. Now you might recognize that's entered some of the Christian circles. People want you to get proved before you baptize. That's not Christian baptism. That's John's baptism. John said, bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. So what is John saying? Now, now, at the end of his sermon, he starts baptizing those people that are putting their faith that God will forgive sins. God will forgive sins upon my confession to him, and I must turn away from my sin. And here comes Jesus to get baptized, <clears throat> along with all the people getting baptized by John. And what does John do? He looks up and stand next in line. He says, next. He baptized the guy. He comes out. First time they've seen somebody getting baptized by somebody else in history. John's baptizing him, and he's sending him out. He looks up. There's Jesus on the, on the, on the not seashore. They weren't in the sea. They were on the River Jordan. And he looks up and sees Jesus. And what's he say to him? Well, it says there in verse number 14, but John forbade him. How many you know that doesn't go well when you tell Jesus you can't? <laughs> right? Oh, no, no, Jesus. No, no, no. How'd that, how'd that work with uh, Peter? Right? What, when Jesus, Jesus said, I'm going to be crucified and put into the hands of the Gentiles and, 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 I'll, and, I'll, and I'll be killed. What did Peter say? Oh, no, Lord. Forbid this. And what did Jesus say? <laughs> Get thee behind me, Satan. Right? So now here's John the Baptist baptizing. And Jesus standing there, he's like, no. <laughs> now, now. He, he doesn't contradict. He doesn't, he doesn't do what Peter did. So, so John the Baptist doesn't get called Satan here. So that's an interesting statement. If Jesus called you Satan, how would you feel? Would you change your ways? I mean, let's give Peter some credit. Amen? He changed his ways. I mean, right? Here he says, he forbade him. Now, who can forbid Jesus, right? Now, there's a question here, though. Now, some, some people get confused here, and they think it's because you're God. You're, you're, you're the Messiah. You're the chosen one. I can't baptize you. That's not the case. Because remember what happened. Look at John chapter 3. Remember, get your neighbor's finger. So you got Luke, you got Matthew, you got John. No, I'm sorry, John chapter 1, not 3. John chapter 1, uh, uh, verse 31. John 1, 31. We read this uh, a few last week, week before, I don't know. But, but you should be familiar with it, so I'm not going to read the whole text. But in John 1, 31, John the Baptist says, And I knew him not, which means I didn't know who the Messiah was. I didn't know the Messiah. The word him there is not Jesus, it's Messiah. I did not know the Messiah. But that he should be made manifest to Israel, Therefore, or that's why, I came baptizing with water. I came to reveal the Messiah. This is a critical to understand why did, Jesus, why did John the Baptist come? God said, go baptize people. And when you see the Holy Spirit descend on somebody, that person who he descends and stays on, that's the Messiah. So John, go show Israel who the Messiah is. I'm going to show you by baptism who the Messiah is. Now you'll understand Jesus' answer. In a minute. First look at verse 32 in John. John 1, 32. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode on him. Who? On Jesus. I, I didn't know who the Messiah was, but I saw it come and land on Jesus. And then he repeats in verse 33. And I knew him not, but he that sent me, that's God, to baptize with water, the same said to me, upon whom thou seest the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he that baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So this is John's record. Remember, John didn't know who Jesus was before the baptism. So let's go back to Matthew. <clears throat> There's a conflict that's taking place here. What is it? He doesn't know that Jesus is the Messiah. So why would he forbid him? And what's he say to him? Look what he says. And, and, and now we're back over in Matthew. We're in Matthew chapter 3. And we're looking at verse number 14. But John forbade him. Oh, no, no. I'm not baptizing you. <laughs> I, don't I think that's funny. I don't know. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine me after the service baptizing people and somebody comes up and says, I'm not baptizing you. <laughs> and then what's the reason? Because you're a better man than me. Right? And that's what the reason is given here. Notice what he says. Uh, I, he says, 
John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? Why are you coming to me, Jesus? Now, when John's over in John, when John the Baptist said, I knew him not, he's not saying, I didn't know who Jesus was. All right? Because remember our study, our study in Luke. Uh, take a look at Luke. Um, uh, let's see. I should follow my notes. Luke 37. I think I wrote it down. Luke 137. Not, yeah. And I'm in Matthew. I'll never find it in Matthew. Never. You'll never find Luke 137 in Matthew. Just won't happen. You can look at all you want. In Luke 1, um, 37, um, I'm sorry, 36. Why did I write 37? That's 36. Luke 1, 36. It says, and behold, the angel speaking to Mary says, behold, thy cousin Elizabeth. Now remember, they're cousins but through their moms. Not their dads. Their dads are from different tribes. We know Jesus from the tribe of Judah. We know it says that, that their, their, their father, Zacharias, was from the tribe of Levi. So therefore, their fathers aren't cousins. They're from different tribes. But what we find here is this idea of cousins must have been through their mother's blood because that, that, you're allowed to marry outside of your tribe as long as you're within Israel. So you see that, by the way, that's very important. Where's Joe when I need him? Uh, Joe, you're allowed to marry outside your tribe as long as it's within Israel. <laughs> we were discussing Ruckmanism yesterday. And... Uh, Anyway, Joe, get that. I'll make him listen to today's sermon. You, you don't need to know that. Um, you, so their mothers were related, right? Aunt, Aunt Mary, right? Or she would have said Aunt Elizabeth, right? Uh, Elizabeth was, uh, I'm sorry, her cousin. Not, I'm not aunt, cousin. Um, so John the Baptist would say Aunt Mary, and Jesus would say Aunt Elizabeth. In that, in that framework, it could be second cousins. They would be second cousins when they're born. John the Baptist and Jesus were related uh, by the blood through their mother's stream. And this is what you'll see. Look at in verse number, uh, uh, well, we can read a couple more. Um, we're in verse 36, and it says, For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid, ah, we don't need to read that. Let's, let's skip over to verse number 56. What did Mary do? It says, And Mary abode with her three months. Oh, we do need to read the next verses. Um, verse 39 it says, Mary arose in those days and went to the hill country with haste to the city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. So Mary goes to uh, her house. How long did she stay? Verse 56. And Mary abode with her three months and then returned to her own house. So here's Mother Mary, the ma mother of Jesus Christ. When she finds out she's going to get pregnant by the Holy Ghost, but she finds out that Elizabeth is pregnant, she, it's your cousin. She goes to her house, spends three months there until the baby's delivered, sees the delivery of John the Baptist, She's now, what, three months pregnant, somewhere about there, and she heads home. And you can understand why Joseph was worried. Mary left town for three months and comes home pregnant. Think that'd bother somebody if that was your fiancé? <laughs> Probably would. You wonder why he's going to put her away privily, right? And, uh, uh, and then the, the, the angel inter intervened, right? Not interfered, but <laughs> intervened and said, don't fear to take Mary. She's still a virgin. She, she has been faithful to you. This is the work of God. And, uh, and Joseph accepted that. Joseph was a great man of faith. Of course, you know, the angel came and told him. So what am I saying here is that Jesus and John the Baptist are related. They knew each other. It's not like he didn't know Jesus. So how does that pertain when we're, when we're looking where he says he forbade him in Matthew? You're coming to me? This is a repentance of sins. This is My baptism is for those people who need to change something in their life. And the soldiers came, and I told them what to do. And the Pharisees came, and I told them what to do. And, and, and all that came to me, they said, well, what should we do then if I want to get baptized by you? He said, do this, do this, do this. Show proof that you've repented from your sin and believe that God had forgiven you, and I'll baptize you. That's John's baptism. And here comes Jesus. And John's like, Jesus, this has nothing to do with you. You should be baptizing me. What's he saying about what he knows about Jesus' life? They don't live too far apart. They've known each other growing up. They're both in their 30s or close. He's witnessed the life of Christ for 30 years. He watched them grow up. He watched the teenage years. They were driving together. They got their permits about the same time. All right? And what does he say about Jesus? You're better than me. He says it before he knows he's the Messiah. He says, you're a better man than you. 
I don't know what sin you're thinking of, Jesus, but I've never seen you do one. It's a testimony to the impeccableness of Christ that John the Baptist himself. So to get to what's happening there in Matthew, uh, we're in Matthew chapter 3. What's happening in Matthew chapter 3 when he says, he forbade him. Why? Now look at Jesus' answer. We're in Matthew 3.15. We're studying the baptism of Jesus. And just what took place here, it's a phenomenal story. And we've got to look at some of the other Gospels. I know, I know, I know. But I'm, I'm not going to do a synopsis the whole way through of all four Gospels. That would be so much fun, but it would probably take us 11 years. So uh, you guys just listen so slow. Um, what is that called, narcissism, when you always blame other people? Um, uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse number 15, it says this. It says, uh, and Jesus answered and said unto him, suffer it to be so now. Okay, what, now what, what's the suffering idea? The idea is allowing, allow this to take place. John, allow it to take place. This isn't right, God. Or he's, he doesn't know he's God yet. He's saying this isn't right because. Um, Ever refer to Jesus as cuz? John could, right? I mean, it would be legit. And uh, second cuz, and uh, I think, and uh, he would say, uh, you're a better man than me. And, and, and you have nothing to repent of. What have you ever done wrong? And Jesus is like, just allow it to happen. John, just allow it to happen. Why? Why? What's Jesus' argument? Now, this can get really deep right here, okay? We're not gonna. But if you want to just, just, Look it up, search it, grab a few, you know, 38 commentaries and just, just have a blast with this, uh, this verse. But suffer it to be so. Why? For it becometh us. Now, if you mark your Bible like I do, I hope you don't because then you can't read it. <laughs> too many marks. But uh, I circle the word us. Uh, you'll read a lot of commentators or maybe the thoughts entered your heart when Jesus says, uh, if, if, it, it, it becometh me. This is about Jesus fulfilling all righteousness. Now, if you go to some commentaries you read, you're going to read a lot of that where Jesus is saying, it's about him, it's about me, Jesus is saying. No, it's not. He says, us. John, you and I have a role to fulfill. Now, think about it. What if Jesus did what John said? Would John ever discover the Messiah? How was John to discover the Messiah? He says in John, uh, the Apostle John, John, the Gospel, he says, God sent me to baptize, and then he said, who you see the Holy Spirit descend on and stay, that's the one. Well, how's that going to happen without John baptizing? He says, I came to baptize, so that the Holy Spirit... So you imagine John baptizing, right? He's baptizing. How long did he baptize? We don't know. We still think it was about a six-month ministry, maybe eight, nine months. He's baptizing, and the guy gets up and leaves, and the lady just starts to watch him. Right? What's he watch for? The Holy Spirit? Anything happen? Uh, nothing. Okay, next guy. Right? And uh, he's baptizing people. And by the way, it was men and women. You want to get that? Uh, what is that in contrast to? Some, can anybody tell me? Circumcision. Men only. John's baptism. What's the difference? Oh, that's right. You want to get that, okay? Because um, then in Colossians chapter two, when they put the two together, baptism and circumcision, they're both spiritually likened to what we're in today. You can distinguish between the two and understand what your Bible is about, Colossians chapter 2. Anyway, you, you dig a little deeper, you'll have fun with that. Um, what's he say here? It, it becometh us, you and me, John, it becometh us in this role that we're playing here to fulfill everything that's right, to fulfill our path, to fulfill our destiny, you know? to fulfill what God has given us to do. Uh, uh, you don't have. You can go a little deeper in that. Look into more of that. What it means to fulfill all righteousness and what Jesus would be meaning by righteousness and what is righteous that the two of them together to perform and 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 what is this thing? Because Jesus' baptism is not John's baptism. John's baptism is repentance for sin. He doesn't have any. He who knew no sin became sin. I was reading today from a messianic guy, and he was talking about why we know Jesus had little sins, you know, uh, when he was growing up and these things. And by, by this time now, God accepted him and washed away all of his sins. And that's referred to, uh, and that's not true. Jesus never had little sin. Even as a child, Jesus have ne never had little sin. Otherwise, he could stand and say, who convinces me of sin? And his own cousin could have stood up, John the Baptist, and said, oh, I knew him when he was a kid. 
Never even a little. Impeccable. Impossible for God to sin. God cannot sin. God cannot tempt with sin. And God cannot be tempted with sin. Remember, when Jesus was tempted of the devil, that word tempted means tested. Jesus wanted to find out if he really was God. Or I'm sorry, Satan wanted to find out if he really was God. That's what Satan was doing. If you be the Son of God. If this is true. All right, did Jesus pass the test? What do you think Satan learned that day? I'm in trouble. <laughs> did Satan understand the incarnation prior to it? What did Satan know? Hmm. Anyway, we're going to get into the temptation next. And that, that might take us a little bit of time. But here we're looking at the baptism. Um, so where were we? I'm looking at my notes here. Uh, it's a mess. You guys aren't following notes at all. Um, both Jesus and John were to fulfill all. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 10. They were to fulfill the role given to them. Mark chapter 1, verse 10 is where we have the baptism. Remember, the baptism of Jesus Christ is, is, all, is it's in all four Gospels. And when you see that, that's, that's, that's an emphasis. It's like the feeding of the 5,000 that's in all four Gospels. Uh, when, when it's repeated four times, God doesn't repeat himself for no reason. And there's also added stuff in each one. Mark chapter 1, verse number 10, it says, And straightway coming up out of the water, uh, he saw the heavens open and the Spirit descending like a dove upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So here we have this um, coming up straightway out of the water. Um, they came up out of the water. That's something you want to, we're going to look at that in a minute. Um, up, well, we can look at it now. Look at John chapter uh, 3 and verse 23. John 3, 23. And Chuck might get them on the screens as fast as you can get them. If you can't get them quick enough, just look up there. He'll get them. Oh, wait, the screens are blank. No, he can't. Oh, that's right. What a great day to have screen trouble. Yes, get with your Bibles. Otherwise, just listen closely or jot these down, and maybe you can look them up later. John chapter number 3, verse 23, um, the Bible says, And John was also baptizing in, in Anon, near to Salem, because there was much water there. There's a lot of water there, and you need a lot of water for baptizing. It says in Mark chapter 10 that Jesus coming up and out of the water. Okay, and then uh, let's see if I remember the next text that I wanted. I don't see it written in my notes here. Um, yes, it's, it's uh, Matthew 3.16 says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went straight up out of the water. Now I want you to go over to Acts chapter number 8. What are we looking at here? This is just a little milk. This is a little something to follow along because you should be able to do this. And I, and I know most of you probably can in Acts chapter 8, you know where I'm going. Uh, Acts chapter 8 and verse number 37. Uh, 36. Let's go back to 36. Acts chapter 8 and verse number 36. For those of you watching on the screen today on uh, face, Facebook, fake book as I call it, um, you got the verses on your screen, so you're, you're doing better here, if I can say the right verse. Acts chapter 8, verse 36, it says, As they went on their way, they came to a certain water. Now, this is where Philip is preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch, and he, he just led him to Christ. He taught him who Jesus Christ is, and the eunuch puts his faith in Christ. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to get baptized? So they come upon some water, and he says, Can I get baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Now, if your Bible doesn't say that, you have the wrong Bible. Um, they, they cut that out of new Bibles. Now, the answer to the question, can I get baptized? Well, what's the requirement? Belief. Oh, beep, 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 beep. A flag just went up your brain, right? I can see some of it. Light bulbs. What was John's baptism? What was the requirement? Repentance. Bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. Is that the requirement for Christian baptism? If thou believest with all thy heart. Ooh, hey, I might see a difference. Yeah, you want to catch that. And he said, if thou believest, what's the requirement for baptism? If you believe, thou mayest. And he answers that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he, and he commanded the chariot to stand still. You don't jump off when it's moving. And they went down both into the water. If you're sprinkling somebody, why do you get in the water? And why does Jesus come out of the water? Because they didn't sprinkle. Now, every historian on the Bible who's worth reading, now I mean everyone, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Catholics, all agree the Baptists retained the ancient form of baptism. Nobody argues it wasn't immersion. Nobody. 
in the first 300 years, nobody did anything but immerse. Why? Because that's baptizing. You go into the water. Now, we are supposed to baptize today. Now, Joe and um, Steve were going to get baptized. But Joe and Steve are working out their schedules, and they're conflicted. So uh, they, they, they postponed the baptism, and that's not a big deal. They postponed it because baptism doesn't save, right? Just following the Lord. And they're both going to become members upon their baptism, so they're going to get baptized together on the 28th, right? As of right now if we don't cancel church. So on the 28th, we'll be baptizing. We'll get to see it, right? The tank right now is about half full because we were just filling it up. And uh, we'll leave the curtains up. We look better that way. And you go down and get into the water. Why? Because that's what baptism is. Baptism means to get into the water, to go under the water. It means to submerge, to plunge, to dunk is the literal inter interpretation. Now, why don't we use the literal interpretation? Does anybody know? Because it looks stupid on the church sign, right? The, the dunking church of Bradford. I mean, wouldn't you rather be the Baptist church? The Bradford Baptist church, the Bradford dunking church. I mean, it just sounds weird, right? But the literal interpretation of the word baptize is dunk. And every any Jew would know that. Anybody would know this. It means to overwhelm, to surround. So what am I saying? If you're, if you're baptized by sprinkling, it, you're not baptized. All right? If you're baptized by pouring, you're not baptized. Yeah. Now, they did clinical baptism. Anybody know that? When people were really sick and they, they were afraid the water would kill them. Because remember, they didn't have the heaters we have today. Um, they didn't want to put a fire underneath there. It's hard on your feet. So they, they they take a person and wrap them all up in sheets or blankets or something, then pour water all over them and say, there, now you're surrounded by water, you're baptized. Why did they pour water all over and surround them in sheets? Because they knew it meant to immerse, to plunge, to be totally under. Do we agree with that? No. That led to some problems. They then then they switch to pouring. They start pouring. Now there's a there's a Greek word for pour, and it's not baptizo. Okay, <laughs> you don't pour water over somebody's head to baptize them. And sprinkle isn't even close to the word baptizo. Okay, nobody. How many of you would take an animal that passed away and your heart's broken? You take him in the backyard and you sprinkle dirt on him. <laughs> you don't do that, right? You bury them. What's the Bible say in Romans uh, chapter 11 that we are buried with him in baptism? And if you're going to plant a garden, what do you do? You take the seed and you just you set it right there on the ground, right? No, what do you do? You put it in the ground a little bit and you put some dirt on it, right? Why do you do that? Because we're planted together with him. It's submerged. It's covered. So what do I say? Well, what do you say? Well, I was baptized. I was sprinkled. Well, you need to get rebaptized. You need to get scripturally baptized. But before you can get baptized, there's something else. What do you got to have? You've got to believe. You've got to believe that Jesus Christ has died for your sins, that Jesus Christ has rose from the dead. You've got to believe that he is the Son of God, the Lord God of all. You've got to believe in the Trinity. You've got to believe that God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. You've got to believe that God became a man, that God in that man form from the virgin womb lived a sinless, impeccable life, that he was, he was, buried, he, I'm sorry, he was crucified for your sins, he was buried and rose again. You've got to believe that, the gospel. You've got to believe the gospel. What's the gospel? Who he is, what he did. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, who he is. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what he did. And thou shalt be saved. You've got to be saved. What's that mean? You can't baptize a baby. Let me ask you, what do you believe? What do you believe? What do we ask a kid? He says, I want to get baptized. Okay. That's great. Kids want to get baptized. One of our bus kids comes in. You know, if they're under 18, we've got to get permission from the parents and whatever. But you're like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, I want to hear about it. Okay, well, let's talk. But what do they have to do? They have to sit down with the pastor. And I, and I try to clearly get from them what it is without leading them. All right? I can ask them, you know. Then, I, then, I, then what I normally do when somebody's getting baptized is I take them for a short time and teach them what baptism means, what, what Christian baptism is, okay? Baptism is to dunk. Now, there's your milk, okay? Now, let's get back into some good stuff. <laughs> what do you do if you've been baptized as a child? And now you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Just get baptized again. So well, I don't want to. It doesn't sound like the Spirit of God. If I found out what the Bible says is not what I did, I'm not calling you evil or bad. I'm just saying it wasn't according to the Bible. Let's just follow God. Right? right? Let's just follow God. And that's all. It's just an easy spirit. Just an easy spirit. Joe was baptized in a, in a church that, that we wouldn't accept their baptism. It's a oneness church, which doesn't believe in the Trinity. And it's also a Pentecostal church. So I said, Joe, to be a member of our church, I'd ask you to get rebaptized in affiliation with the doctrine we hold. He's like, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. See, that's a sign of somebody saved. Yeah? No? 
The same thing happened with Steve. Right? And he's like, well, let's just make sure. Steve had a scriptural baptism by immersion, but, a, but it was an Anabaptist church. And he, right? Mennonite? Mennonite, Anabaptist, right? Which is part of our heritage. And many of the Mennonites, we cling to, but they don't believe in eternal security. And they don't believe in uh, several other doctrines. Their, their, their church government's not right. And I said, well, would you mind? He goes, oh, not at all. Not at all. I got baptized when I was 30. I was an ordained preacher. You remember that, Mrs. K? Were you there? You were there. Oh, that's so sweet. Was that weird? I was over 30. <laughs> Thank you, my love. <laughs> we only got five minutes left. Um, we'll skip over that. Oh, man. We, we've made it through half of the notes, and uh, so we're going to have to pick this up next week. Maybe tonight. I'd like to finish it tonight, so if you're watching, I'll finish tonight. Get back here and get the second half, because it, it gets good. It, it, gets, it gets meaty, okay? No, it's, it, it gets... It, I like the light stuff, too. It's good stuff. Let's see. They came up out of the water, right? The, and the, the, the Ethiopian eunuch came up out of the water. That's what water baptism is. Don't, don't fight it. Don't get it. Just, oh, okay. Well, why did they do it wrong? Well, that's a good study. If you want to study why, how baptism has morphed over the years. But listen, everybody knows that, that scriptural baptism, um, according to the early church and the apostles, they only baptized by water. Why does the other churches not do that no more? Let's study it. I'd love to sit down with you and help you understand what happened. And uh, listen, what they were evil when they did it. When they changed the form of baptism, many of them, they did it for good reasons. But it's never a good reason to change what God has ordained. You know, they wanted to help people. That's what they really wanted to do. And uh, sometimes in our zeal to help people, we can actually go outside the Bible. And that's, that's a danger that you're always in. Why? Because we love people. It's the second great commandment. Uh, different requirements for baptism. We saw that. One was bring forth fruits, Luke chapter 3, verse 8. The other one is Acts chapter 8, verse 37. Do, the, do you believe? We see now that John's baptism is not Christian baptism, and Jesus' baptism stands in the middle. It wasn't John's. Was it, was it Christian baptism? Jesus, do you believe with all your heart that you died for your sins? What are you going to say to Jesus? Does Jesus have to believe in his heart that he is the Son of God? Is that why God said it from heaven? Thou art my son, and I'm well pleased. Just like, oh, I am? Can omniscience learn something? Is Jesus omniscient? Is he God? Did he ever stop being God? When he became a man, did he stop becoming God? Becoming God. That's a bad saying. Did he stop being God? No. He never stopped being God. He's God. He can't learn. He knows everything. He knows he's the son of the... Why did God say it? Well, who else was standing there? John the Baptist. Right? Who was God talking to when he said, this is my son? Who was God talking to? Hey, John. <laughs> when you're like, God should have said that right from him. Hey, John. What? <laughs> That's him. Right? And uh, in case you're wondering, that was the Holy Spirit that just came down to sign as a dove. It's a major event. Why? All right, our last major event. Ooh, minute and a half. Can't do it? We'll do it in three. Ready? Luke chapter 3, verse 21. Check this out. Oh, this is cool. Luke 3, 21. And then get your finger in Matthew 3 and a Mark 10, or Mark 1. So we got, let's just look at this major event, and then we're going to move on. Uh, not going to move on. We're going to pick it up here tonight. What did I say? Luke chapter 3, Mark chapter 1, and Matthew chapter 3. And you want to look at this, because when this happens, something big is, is coming down, okay? It doesn't happen very often. What doesn't? Check this out. It says, uh, Luke, well, let's go in order, okay? Let me rearrange my order. So we'll still go Matthew, Mark, Luke, right? How's that work? Does that work for you? Makes it easier. Matthew, 1, 6, Matthew 3, 16. Matthew 3, 16. There's another 3, 16 in our Bible. It's great. So Matthew 3, 16, and then Mark 1, 10, and then Luke 3, 21. So that way... Uh, Chuck back there is all ready for everybody online. It says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo. Now, when you see that word lo, what's that mean? Right? Whoa! Holy cow! That's what it means. All right. Wow! Lo! Pay attention! Whoa! Dude. However you want to put it, that's what that lo is. This is like, Something big 
is about to happen. It's very close to a behold. The heavens were opened unto him. Now, there's a little different statement here, because look at verse 17. Don't, don't, you don't have to go there, Chuck. I'll just read it, um, where it says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then it's going to be a little different in some other places. So, uh, the heavens were open to who? And what does it mean, the heavens open? Anybody think of another place in the Bible? Uh, wait, wait, first look at Mark. Mark 1.10. When does the heaven open? And what in the world does that mean? How do you open up heaven? Anybody got the can opener? You got these little neat ones now that, that crawl around the can? Anybody got one of those? Right. I bought one for my wife because she hates the one under her counter. She was like, honey, this thing is stupid. So I bought her one. You put it on the can and push the button and it crawls around the can and cuts the top off. It's kind of cool, right? Is there one of those for heaven? A friend of mine one time had, he locked the keys in his trunk. And it wasn't his car, it was his friend's car, but it was a customer's car. And so he called the locksmith and said, come get it open without destroying the lock. So the locksmith is down there working on it, and he's just talking to him. He's like, can, can I ask you a question? The guy's working on the lock. He's like, yeah, sure. Anything. He's like, can, can you give me a key for heaven? Well, first he said, can you make a key for about anything? He goes, oh, yeah, about any lock I can get into. He's like, can you give me a key to heaven? <laughs> the guy just went. <laughs> Got to start working. He says, can you know? And that's how he started witnessing to the guy. And, uh. I thought, well, that was kind of cool. Um, Mark, J he's kind of insane. One of my best friends. That was, that was Bill Shuey. Uh That's how he's, every conversation, he's witnessing a guy. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 10. It says, and straightway, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open. Now, one place says heaven, another place says heavens. Uh, don't get too confused about the heavens. There's three heavens. What's the first heaven? The air. That's where the birds fly. What's the second heaven? That's where the planets are, the moon, is that, and is that. Where's the third heaven? It's where God is, and Paul went up to the third heaven. So uh, that's the, when God says heavens, that's what he's referring to. But the heavens were opened, right? Now look at uh, Luke. We're going in order, right? I got him backwards here. Luke 3.21D. What's that mean? The end of the verse. Um, you never go past D when you label a verse A, B, and C. So the last phrase in Luke chapter 3, verse 21, um, it says, The heaven was opened. Where... What does it mean? What is that? I mean, the heaven opens up to what? Does anybody? Where else was the heavens open? Anybody got one right off the top of their head? Revelation? You're right. Revelation. Somebody else said somebody else? Any? Oh, Acts chapter 7. Oh, what did he see? What do you see when the heavens open? How many times does the heaven open in the Bible? And when it does, what did they see? Because what they see when heaven opens, and what would what happens when the heavens open? What does that mean? Think about science now. Think about what they're looking at and how heavens can open. How something can be opening up to a revelation into another world, a world that is unseen unless their opening comes. Who initiated the opening? Did the opening come from the other side or from this side? Can heaven be opened from this side, or does it have to be opened from the other side? What happens in chapter 19 of Revelation when it says, and it tells us about the sixth seal when the heavens just depart like a scroll? What does that mean? You ever see a scroll as it rolls up? It rolls in. It was talking about rolling out. What does that mean? How does that dimension open? And who opens it? And who initiates it? And what happens when it opens? And what vision is seen? Oh, Revelation chapter 4, Revelation chapter 19, Acts chapter 7. Oh, we got a good start, don't we? Yes, we'll start there tonight. We'll pick it up. We'll see what happens when the heavens open and see what people see when the heavens open. And, uh, that's exciting. Uh, the heavens opened here today. So, uh, well, <laughs> about here today. I meant the heavens opened here. And, and as we, at the day that Jesus was baptized, he came out of the water. Luke is the only one that tells us this, but it said uh, Jesus came out of the water. What did he do? He began to pray. Now, it doesn't tell us what he prayed. It just says that he prayed. Now, this is a practice that many of us Anabaptist histories, if you go back in our history, um, people had to give a testimony prior to their baptism, and then afterwards they, were, they prayed. And that, that's been a public thing that we've done for a lot of years. Um, we don't generally follow that practice here. I make him give a testimony. Uh, have you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes, I have. That's, their, that's the only testimony we generally have him do. And then usually I pray for them afterwards. But Jesus came out of the water after being baptized and said, this is the customary way a Jew prayed, looked up to heaven. 
and pray. What did he see? Our Father, and the heavens went. Another day. And John's in the water going, all right. <laughs> and then what happened? God, I thank you for this day and this hour. What's the Holy Spirit look like? It says it didn't look like a dove. It's not the idea behind it, but it came down as a dove flies down, gently, slowly. Has, has there ever been a time in heaven or in, on earth when God descended? What does it look like when God descends? Moses said, in three days, God will descend. And he did. I'm sorry. When God, the glory of Shekinah, as they named it, it's not in the Bible, but it's a, the inner glory that hovered between the cherubim, that light that was from another planet, from another world, that nobody's ever even dreamed of, that light that did not generate from the sun, but it's an ephoral light. It's a light that existed prior to the light of the any light in our universe, and it hovered between the two on the mercy seat. The two wings of the cherubim came up, and there was a light inside that room that was not from this world. They walked in that light. What, what was that? What was happening as the, as the heavens opened and that light was suddenly extinguished? And out of the Ark of the Covenant, above the tabernacle, a cloud would reach up to the heavens and spread over the camp. The camp of the Israelites, 12 miles in diameter. Far bigger than Bradford. And this cloud that came down in a pillar right to that. Jesus is standing there. The heaven opened. Descending. And a voice. Well, I'll tell you what. It gets good. Amen. We'll have some fun with it later. We'll keep going. Study your Bible. Learn your Bible. What, what are we doing today? Well, I don't know. What's the invitation? What's God doing in your heart? What's God doing in your life? It's just faith in Christ. Just faith in Christ. If you're not saved, say, put your faith in Christ. If you're watching somebody here. How about baptized? Maybe you haven't been baptized. We're going to baptize on the 28th. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'd like to come affiliate with us, that's what the two things that Christian baptism is, I'd invite you to get baptized on the 28th with the, with the other two guys. And we got rows for the ladies. You can, come, you can get scripturally baptized if you haven't been. But, but I want to talk to you first. Are you a believer? If you are, get baptized. Just follow the Lord. Just, just let God do it. Follow Him. Perhaps you're not a member of the church. You need, you need to get that down. We have these two guys becoming members of the church upon their baptism. God wants you in a church. God wants you in a church. Uh, whatever the Lord is doing in your life, just, just let him have his way. We're going to sing it as well in my soul. So we'll have our panel player come, and uh, we're going to ping at, uh, sing, what is it, page 275? Let's stand up and let's sing a song. Page 275, I think. I wrote it down, but I lost it. It's under the pulpit somewhere, but if you looked behind this pulpit, you'd understand. Page 275. It is well with my soul. If it's not well with your soul today, the altar, the altar's open. These, these front pews, this is where we come to pray. Uh, you come right up here, just bow to the Lord and pray. If it's not well with your soul, get it well with your soul. Settle whatever it is. Settle whatever it is. Let's sing It Is Well With My Soul as an invitational. I'm going to get a sip of water because I love this song. Here we go. When peace like a river
my sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul, it is well with my soul. Church, have a great day. Dang it, you know.